Anne Rice does. She makes millions of dollars writing books about lonely, lovable vampires. And in the case of her latest book, Lasher, about a lecherous spirit who becomes a man. Her books are eerie and erotic, but still that doesn't quite explain why they sell the way they do. John Hockenberry is here to unravel that particular mystery. Let's see you do it. Why people buy Anne Rice uh -huh. books is difficult to really answer, but the best way is to look at actually some of the words. Now, Anne Rice's millions of readers count on her for this kind of a scene. Two guys, one coffin, all right? Here we go. Now, I'm getting into the coffin, he finally said to me in his most disdainful tone, and you will get in on top of me if you know what's good for you. And I did, and he shut the lid. Then I asked him if I was completely dead. No, you're not. When you are, you'll only hear and see it changing and feel nothing. You should be dead by tonight. Go to sleep. Does that uh, speak to you? It's different, that's for sure. <laughs> trying to classify Anne Rice, for years people have been trying to do it, but as we discovered, that's just not something Anne Rice thinks very much about. I've been very, very fortunate. I have written the weirdest, most way out, transgressive stuff imaginable, and I've been rewarded for it. Rewarded is an understatement. Anne Rice is a one-woman literary dynasty, and her fans can't get enough. Neither, apparently, can her publisher. Rice's latest three-book deal with Knopf is worth a reported $17 million. She's worth it. Anne Rice's 13 books sell by the boatload. Over 150 million copies are in print worldwide. But try to find a source for her inspiration. It's as elusive as the ghosts and spirits she puts in her books. She grew up in steamy, sultry New Orleans, where lots of American writers have found stories and characters, but that doesn't really explain it. If you looked in the Catholic Church, where she was raised on saints and devils, you'd be getting closer. To sit and listen to the miracles that happened to this saint or that saint, or how somebody floated up in the air during prayer, I mean, that, that was just the normal fare in Catholic school. I just had to write on the wall. At home in the room where she creates it all, there are lots of clues, some scribbled on the wall in black felt tip pen. I write myself little notes like giants bred from tulpas, you know. A tulpa is something you conjure up in your imagination and then it takes life and you can't get rid of it. What Rice is capable of conjuring up in her imagination might make the nuns back at school a little nervous, like the beginning of her latest book. Lasher opens with uh, a teenage girl uh, seducing her family members. Yeah. Is this a notion close to you? as I imagine you prowling around the boarding schools and uh, hangouts of your oh, no. youth? No, I was a totally repressed child and never really seduced anybody. The only man I've ever been with is my husband. But my imagination is X-rated. If the main character suddenly appears in manacles surrounded by slave boys in leather, her fans aren't surprised. They've read it all. A book about a spirit who haunts 13 generations of a family and also has sex with them an Egyptian vampire queen who tried to improve the world by exterminating all the men, except for a few breeders. A 500-page novel about singing Italian eunuchs. In the mid-80s, she cranked out a trilogy of novels set in a world she candidly describes as a Disneyland of S&M. What interested me there was the fantasy. I'm not sure that um, I would ever want to own a pair of handcuffs but or a whip. But don't you think the people who read your... your soft porn or even your hard it's porn hard porn hard yeah. porn yeah it's no definitely I, x-rated but don't you think that they be, they believe that upstairs you've got like some room with sure but i don't <laughs> i'm a boring person i don't see any reason why i should have a room up there with whips and and handcuffs any more than i should be a vampire vampires that's what ann rice is best known for her vampire books i think there are those people who who simply dismiss any literature or any film that has to do with vampires but I think they're making a very bad mistake and there are many 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 more people who very much uh, enjoy vampire literature and they see it as very profound generally vampire literature Anne Rice's publishers certainly take her very seriously but not as seriously as Anne Rice takes herself what is there to say about vampires they're doomed because they have to kill and drink blood well, that much we know. Do you think they like being vampires? N yes and no. They enjoy the sensuous pleasure and the heightened um, ability to see colors and hear music and so forth, but they really 
the, the, the more they experience, the wiser they get, and the more horrible it is to have to kill. Which I, I you know, kind of think is a metaphor for the human condition. Metaphor for the human condition? Well, it is, though, a metaphor, because all of us make ruthless compromises in order to live, don't you think? They want that great life that they've got, which is what we want. But they have to drink blood to get yeah, it. They ha and they love to drink blood. It is like sex to them, which I, th I think it would be to a vampire. I think it would be delicious. You'd get the other person's life, fantasies, dreams all coming through the blood. You know, it would be great. The inhuman condition of vampires provides a way for Anne Rice to explore what even she would call a rich fantasy life. But fantasies filled with themes that blend the serious with the bizarre, the mortal with the immortal, pain and pleasure, male and female. Take Rice's favorite character, the vampire Lestat, an irresistible French guy from the 1800s who haunts his way through time acquiring blood, money, and playing rock and roll. Who is Lestat? Who is Lestat? Well, Lestat is my hero. Um, he's the male I would like to be. He's my dream self. He's the, he's the guy who got made a vampire against his will and has made the best of it. And I love him. Anne Rice introduced Lestat to the world with the novel, Interview with the Vampire. Three novels later, there's an encyclopedic vampire guide to help sort out Lestat's two centuries worth of adventures. And then there's his arrival in Hollywood. These fans lined up at open auditions in New Orleans last month to play extras in the movie version of Interview. Hollywood spent nearly two decades trying to find the movie in Anne Rice's novel. Interview with the Vampire, the movie, has a big Hollywood budget. Big Hollywood producer named David Geffen, an A-list director named Neil Jordan, and a big monster Hollywood star to play Lestat. Filming begins here next month, and so by this time next year, fans of Anne Rice may get to see their beloved vampire Lestat on the big screen. The creation of Anne Rice, come alive prowling the sidewalks and shadows of New Orleans in the terrifying face of Tom Cruise? If you don't use any part of this interview but that, please say that Tom Cruise is a wonderful actor. He was fabulous in Born on the Fourth of July, but oh. he's been cast as Lestat, and the readers, by and large, view this as a disaster. Because he looks more like a newspaper delivery boy than a well, I blood sucker? I wouldn't say that. I think he's a very physically beautiful guy. Uh, Lestat. Lestat is supposed to be six feet tall, blonde with blue eyes, and be a feline, almost androgynous being, and yet ferociously aggressive in a stereotypical male sense. Tom Cruise doesn't suggest any of those traits. Anne Rice's fans were outraged over the casting of Tom Cruise, but that might not matter very much to the studio. As far as they're concerned, it's a bottom line issue, and Tom Cruise's fans outnumber Anne Rice's fans. It's simple math. Anne Rice fans could be marching to the gates of Warner Brothers with flaming torches, and I really don't think they'd care. I mean, I really cannot tell you how much I despise Hollywood producers and the studio system, and, and many of the people I've worked with there, I think they're awful. I can't warn writers enough to stay away from them. They will kill you. So you hate Hollywood? I hate them. Hate them. I hate them. Anne Rice prefers her wood and brick and greenery to Hollywood's plastic. It's where her characters and her family live. The 1852 mansion in New Orleans Garden District, or the 19th century orphanage she is restoring as a place for family reunions. It's great. Imagine walking down these huge 14-foot high corridors at night, opening the doors to the two-story chapel, and going in and seeing the vigilites flicker on the saints. That's well, kind of spooky, though. Yeah. Down the corridor. Actually, it... <laughs> <laughs> right. It's very much it's like that. It's crossed your mind. Yeah. And, yeah. Anne Rice's spooky world follows her around. Here at the annual Vampire Lestat Halloween party, fans get to dress up, act out, and mingle with their cherished author, her husband Stan, and son Chris. When I go to my signings, I'm the most boring person there. Everybody else is dripping with velvet and lace and whips and handcuffs and bringing me dead roses wrapped in leather handcuffs. And I love it. I'm just sitting there, you know. <laughs> and I say, gee, you don't look the way we thought. <laughs> but don't tell me what that would have been. <laughs> Growing up among all the boring ghosts and monsters, chains and blood-sucking, 
15-year-old Chris Rice is, by all accounts, a perfectly normal teenager. Did she ever punish you? Um, not in the traditional methods of oh, punishing me. That's kind of disturbing, not in the traditional way? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, we're talking <laughs> yeah, about we your mom room and back Rice. There. No, um, no, not like you're grounded for two weeks. More like, I can't believe you did that. Anne Rice, her characters, and her family all inhabit a kind of twilight. If the good-humored Chris is part of the dawn, then his sister Michelle haunts the night. More than 20 years ago, Michelle, Anne's daughter, and first child died of leukemia, just shy of her sixth birthday. Her mother was at her side. A daughter's mortality began Anne Rice's search for the immortal and her writing career. I wanted to write and write and write and pour out my emotions and make stories and create something. That was my response to seeing something die and something pass out of my hands like that and seeing this beautiful child die no matter what I did or anybody else did. Could you ever answer the question where people, daughters go after they die? Um, the answer I'm going to give is kind of sentimental. I hope she went up into the light. I suspect really, truly in my heart that she did. My strong suspicion 20 years ago was that there was nothing. But that's the way I felt when Michelle died, that she didn't go anywhere, that she simply stopped, that the light went out. Just like somebody had pinched the flame. If there is a source for her inspiration, Anne Rice says it's the big questions. The ruthless lawyers and bad marriages of popular fiction don't interest her. Good and evil, life and death, heaven and hell do. When I was a young writer, I could hear people laughing, like choruses of people surrounding me laughing at everything I wrote. But I thought, look, if you're going to do this, you have to do it your way because you're not good at anything else. You're an excessivist, you're an extremist. Just do it and you, you have to take the risk of making a fool of yourself. At this point in her career, that's the last thing she needs to worry about. I, I want to be loved and never forgotten. I'm really um, greedy. You know, I want to be immortal. We'll be back in just a moment.